As you may know, the United States is its own country. We're independent. That means that no other country comes in and writes our laws and tells us what to do. Our war for independence, though, was long and, and bloody and full of American patriotism and eagles and star-spangled awesomeness. Because of it, today we don't have a king, we don't drink tea at four, and our humor isn't dry and witty. But how do we get to the point of being a monarch-free, tealess, blue-white, and ready-for-anything nation? Well, it goes back to the early 1700s, when we were lowly British colonists. The American War for Independence didn't start with tea parties or declarations or sailing ships at night on Christmas Day. It started with the concept of mercantilism. That's a fancy word that means a belief that the government should regulate the economy in order to increase national power and income, which is achieved by encouraging local production of goods and balancing trade. In other words, England wants to make as much money for itself as possible, while at the same time preventing other countries from capitalizing on resources and monopolizing trade. Just a quick refresher, remember at this point in the world, there are three superpowers, England, France, and Spain. They are all trying to get more land so they can make more money, so they can get more power to take over more land. But how does land get you more money? Sweet, sweet, raw materials. And that's where mercantilism comes in. Consider this scenario. Let's say you live in New England. Your region has a lot of wooded areas. You spend a lot of time chopping down trees and that gives you lumber to make things. Now, while you have access to a lot of raw materials, you aren't as industrial as England. So, you sell your raw materials to England, who, while they don't have raw materials, do have access to manufacturing. They convert that raw material into a finished good and sell it back to you. England's economy grows. And as a colony of England, your economy grows. So, the more land you have, the more colonies you can establish. And the more colonies you establish, the more people you have to settle in those colonies to collect resources, to make more money, to give you more power, to get more land. It's a big crazy cycle. Hopefully though, at this point, you're starting to realize that for England, the colonies are really super important to their economy. So at this point, around 1750s, England and the colonies were doing pretty well. So well that England pretty much gave the colonies free range to solve their own problems. Many had established their own parliament-esque government and passed their own laws on how to create and collect taxes. These political freedoms, coupled with the promise of religious tolerance, economic opportunity, and really, really cheap land, made moving to the colonies an attractive option. So much so, that the colonies were starting to get a little bit too big for themselves and wanted to settle further west, specifically in an area known as the Ohio River Valley, which would have been great if someone wasn't already there. The French claimed that this land was theirs. They had developed great relationships with the Native Americans in that area and were capitalizing on lucrative fur trade. To establish their ownership of this land, in 1754, the French built a fort in the area called Fort Duquesne. Feeling uneasy about this, the government of Virginia sent a militia to attack the fort, defeating a small scouting party surrounding it. Now the leader of this militia was strong, handsome, debonair, and wanting to change history. But we'll talk more about him later. Shortly after this attack, France declared war on England, marking the start of the French and Indian War, also known as the Seven Years' War that actually lasted nine years. There were a few times in history when wars are started for one reason, and this is one of them. This war was about land. Now I'm not going to go into great deal about each battle, but know this, colonists are terrible soldiers. Because of this, and in order to protect their colonial investment, England was forced to intervene and send their own soldiers to help fight. After a series of battles, back and forth victories between both sides, the turning point came in 1759, when the British captured Fort Duquesne, followed by Ticonderoga, and finally Montreal. This forced the French forces to surrender. As a result, France gave Canada to England, as well as removed their troops from the Ohio River Valley. And there was much rejoicing. Yay! But the rejoicing was short-lived. There were some negative effects to this war. First, with the departure of the French from the Ohio River Valley, the Native Americans in that area lost their biggest trading partners and protectors, who were replaced with colonists notorious for stealing land and starting fights. The natives weren't too happy about the colonists who were now invading their land in droves, and as a result, natives had a tendency to initiate attacks on farms and communities. Second, in case you didn't know, wars are really expensive. 
and England had to spend a lot of money to send troops and supplies to protect and defend the colonists. This led to a predicament. England needed more money to pay for the war, so they wanted the colonists to travel less and capitalize on the raw resources that were there. But if they traveled west, they were in danger of Native American attacks, and dead colonists can't gather resources and grow British economy. So to protect them, they could send more troops, but that costs even more money. So what's a king to do? Introducing King George III of England, who had been crowned in 1760. He was known for being proud, stubborn, and as one historian put, he was very stupid. Really, really stupid. Hey man, I'm just citing some sources, don't blame me. He was a man of action though, and he set out to solve some major problems of protecting the colonists from Native American attacks while also getting England more money. He hoped to accomplish this by passing a series of acts, the first known as the Proclamation of 1763. This proclamation drew a line down the crest of the Appalachian Mountains. Colonists were meant to stay to the east of it, and Native Americans were meant to stay to the west of it. Seemed pretty simple, right? <sighs> Except it wasn't. The colonists who had just gained this new land to settle and were used to pretty much going wherever they wanted called this an act of tyranny. They argued that the land had already been mostly settled and that this was the only place for farmers to farm. Hey now, John Locke, I don't think we need you quite yet, but stay tuned. Because of this, colonists ignored the king's proclamation and settled westward anyway, evoking the wrath of a lot of the natives in the area and forcing England to send an additional 7,500 more troops to protect them. Now in an effort to gain more money for England, the next act that was passed was the Sugar Act of 1764. This act lowered the price of molasses, sugar, wine, and rum. Wait, lowered? How could this possibly help the economy? Well, the goal of this act was actually to directly compete with other competitors specifically smugglers, who like to steal goods from ships, sell them at a lower price, and keep the profits for themselves. In addition, this act also allowed British courts to try colonial smugglers back in England, taking away some of their colonial judiciary rights. These rights were rights that some of them had had for over a hundred years. Now, it should be mentioned that these courts were notoriously lenient when it came to smugglers because who didn't like cheap sugar? So needless to say, the colonists were not fond of this act, specifically the lower and middle class colonists. The only colonists that really liked it were wealthy merchants who directly traded with England. Yay mercantilism! The next act passed was the Currency Act of 1764, which prohibited the use of bills or printed money as a form of currency. Only gold or silver could be used. In the colonies, there was a constant shortage of gold though. The only way to obtain gold was through trading with England. But due to this shortage, many colonists issued their own form of paper money and they called it bills of credit. But because there was no common regulation and in fact no standard value on which to base these notes, confusion ensued. The Currency Act effectively allowed England to assume control of the colony's currency system, abolishing the use of paper money altogether. The result of this caused the colonies to suffer a chronic shortage of funds. The Currency Act threatened to destabilize the entire colonial economy of New England, Middle and Southern colonies. And without money or the opportunity to earn more money, how could one pursue happiness? Right John Locke? The next act was the Stamp Act, but that gets its own video, so we're going to continue right along for now with the next one, the Quartering Act of 1765, and whew, boy this one was a doozy. While all this was going on, colonists were still disobeying the proclamation of 1763 and getting themselves killed by Native Americans. More and more troops were being sent to protect them and they were running out of places to live. Thus, the Quartering Act was passed. This act ordered colonists to provide British troops with quarters, or houses, as well as furnish the soldiers with candles, firing beds, cooking utensils, salt, vinegar, and beer cider. All of this cost the colonists a lot of money and, of course, an invasion of their personal space. It goes without saying that the colonists did not like this one bit. Some colonists said that this was worse than paying taxes. Other government assemblies refused to obey. In both cases, they suffered consequences from the king. With all these acts, and the rise of Sons of Liberty that can be found in the Stamp Act video right here, tensions were mounting, King George was getting crazier, and all of the rights of the people were in jeopardy. Thomas Jefferson said it best when he said the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. 
and that time was fast approaching, starting with the worst snowball fight in American history.